Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. This is a security analysis of the Democracy Live! online voting system. I'm Mike Spector, and this is joint work with JLX Alderman. So this is, is a security analysis of an internet voting system used in the 2020 US federal elections. And to begin, I'd like to start by explaining a bit of a tightrope act that we have to do here. On the one hand, as researchers, we have to be able to critique the systems that we're using in order to protect uh, voters and improve the democratic process. On the other, we have to be careful to avoid allowing our work to be taken out of context and used to attack the very institutions we're trying to protect. So here's a bit of a disclaimer. Nothing in this work indicates that the 2020 presidential election was hacked. To the best of our knowledge, OmniBallot, the product that we're evaluating here from Democracy Live, was thankfully not used in Pennsylvania, Georgia, or Arizona. And we stand by the letter we signed along with 50 other election security researchers, stating that there is no compelling evidence of computer fraud in the 2020 presidential election outcome. You can read more about that here. Now with that out of the way, why would we want to do this analysis at all? So last year I presented a paper on another internet voting system called Votes that was also used in US federal elections. And we found that Votes had vulnerabilities that would allow a number of different kinds of adversaries to alter, stop, or expose a user's vote. And as a result, most of the counties using votes actually abandoned the product. This included a number of jurisdictions in Oregon and Colorado, as well as the entire state of West Virginia. Unfortunately, COVID-19 caused states to reconsider, uh, and uh, a number adopted new voting mechanisms. And a few actually adopted yet another internet voting system called Democracy Lies OmniBallot. Now, the system had actually seen some adoption already. Uh, in fact, it was used by seven state governments and 98 jurisdictions in 11 states, but at a much lower level. For instance, the planned adoption for 2020 presidential uh, primaries included uh, use by 22% of West Virginia's population, which is uh, significantly higher than the margin of error. But as though that's not enough, uh, Delaware and New Jersey actually plan on using it for uh, the totality of their population. Um, so this leads to a very obvious question, right? Does Democracy Live system actually fare any better than votes? Now, there's a number of things that actually made performing this analysis somewhat difficult. And the first is that election systems have a number of subtle security requirements that are not seen in, the, in other systems. Uh, and in fact, electronic voting has really been a topic of research since the 80s in the academic cryptography and system security literature. And as a result, we have a pretty good handle on the kind of definitions in the cryptographic sense uh, for what we want. So let's go through those and it'll explain a little bit about why the, the requirements are somewhat subtle. So the first two are relatively straightforward. Uh, there's correctness and usability, which just states that a vote is counted as cast, cast as intended, and accessible to all eligible voters. The second is privacy, which just states that an attacker cannot learn a voter selection. Okay, so so far this is straightforward. Uh, but then there's receipt freeness, which states that a voter uh, cannot prove the way that they voted after the fact, and this prevents uh, vote selling, actually. And there's coercion resistance, which states that a voter cannot cooperate with an attacker to prove the way they voted, so they can't be forced into voting a way that an attacker wants them to vote. Finally, there's this idea of end-to-end -end verifiability, uh, which has actually been the main focus of cryptography research. Here, voters are given some proof that their vote was actually counted in the final tally correctly. And this is considered a prerequisite for internet voting as it allows us to remove trust in the system's servers and other infrastructure used to cast the ballot. A further complication that we have to contend with here is that we have to be kind of careful in our analysis. Democracy Live's Omni Ballot has multiple modes that have different threat models. For example, there's ones that simply just deliver the ballot, in which case the ballot is physically uh, marked, printed, and mailed back. Then they have a remote accessible vote by mail system, which is sort of like a ballot marking device, but you're using your computer and printing it out at home instead of uh, going to a polling place. So the ballot here is marked electronically, uh, but then physically printed and mailed. Finally, they have uh, full on internet voting, where the ballot is marked electronically and sent back through Democracy Live servers. So with all this in mind, we really wanted to know first, how well does Democracy Live achieve those correctness goals that we had before, the cryptographic goals that we had before, including correctness, privacy, receipt freeness, and coercion resistance? 
Second, is the system actually end-to-end -end verifiable, right? This is an internet voting system after all, and this is a, generally seen as a requirement for an internet voting uh, system to work. Second, what are the non-valid uh, privacy properties of the system, right? Because uh, a voting system inherently gets a lot of information about voters, and uh, it would be very uh, useful to know exactly how, uh, how it treats uh, voter data. And third, how well do these other modes of democracy life fare, and how does one even begin to, to analyze them? Now, the final challenge we faced was the general obnoxiousness of the system and the, the documentation involved. And the easiest way to explain this is via a walkthrough of how the voter actually ends up interacting with the product. So this is what you first see when you begin to use OmniBallot. Each instance of OmniBallot is actually skinned to look like it is from the department running the election, not Democracy Live. Uh, in this case, this is from the state of Delaware. First, the user is asked to enter their name and birth date, followed by uh, the last four digits of their social security number. Now at this point, they've already begun sort of recording a lot of invasive information about the voter, and naturally one would wonder what their privacy policy says, and it looks like there's one right here, uh, except that this turns out to be Google's privacy policy, not Democracy Lives. And in fact, there is no omni-ballot privacy policy. Anyway, after the voter uh, has actually authenticated, uh, they, use, they get to see this following screen uh, to select uh, which type of return uh, uh, system that they would like. So for instance, via fax, by email, or electronic return. But what's really interesting here is that there's this text that says, please note, uh, and it ends with, these ballots are scanned for tabulation with other absentee ballots. No votes are counted or cast online under any circumstances. And what's interesting here is that literally right below this text, there are these two boxes that say via email or electronic return. Um, and to put it charitably, they have a very, seem to have a very uh, uh, odd interpretation of the term cast. Finally, uh, the user is allowed to vote and then confirm their vote. And uh, they, they're treated to this nice success screen uh, uh, that has a number of interesting features, including this nice link uh, to technical support where you can uh, report a bug. Uh, so we found a few bugs in our analysis, and uh, we'd actually like to see what they, what they uh, have to say here. Um, and it turns out they do have like a coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy. And let me read it to you. It says, by submitting a report, we agree not to disclose the bug to any third parties without the prior approval of Democracy Live. Well, at least it's straightforward, um, but we can't really agree to this. Uh, and we can't really trust their documentation because a lot of the, the things that we saw earlier were kind of misleading. Uh, and we didn't really want to report, never report our findings. Uh, so we actually had to perform this analysis without involvement of the company. And this led to a number of constraints, and a key challenge was that we actually really couldn't touch their server infrastructure for a number of legal and ethical concerns. Uh, and therefore, we had to make a number of assumptions about how their backend worked. And our solution here was to manually reverse engineer the client, and then iteratively re-implement the server, the server side to better understand the protocol. And to be charitable to them, we're going to assume the best possible case for the backend in our analysis, and whenever we deviated from this assumption, we explicitly discussed why in the paper. Uh, finally, what I'm about to present is an analysis of the system as of June 2020, and we make no claims about anything they've done since. So what did we find? Well, the system is a large, relatively complicated web app that relies on a number of third parties to perform its services. The app dynamically fetches and runs JavaScript loaded from Amazon, Google, and Cloudflare, uh, making all three companies, as well as Democracy Live itself, potential points of compromise for the election system. We also found that the system is not end-to-end -end verifiable and not coercion resistant or receipt free. Uh, we found that attackers could manipulate the ballot design, compromise ballot secrecy, and invisibly change votes. Uh, and the only thing that really prevented the client, the server, or uh, any of these third parties from doing so uh, was the use of physical media. So for instance, blank ballot printing, uh, the client, the server, or third parties could very easily manipulate the ballot design but couldn't necessarily compromise ballot secrecy or invisibly change votes because, of course, the ballot is printed out and physically marked and then mailed back. Uh, but, of course, marked ballot printing, when you do the remote accessible vote by mail option, uh, could be manipulated and uh, the ballot design could be manipulated and uh, the secrecy of the ballot was, in fact, compromised. And finally, an online ballot return, uh, there was nothing protecting the user uh, much at all. 
So how do, well did Democracy Live fare in, in the realm of privacy? Well, the system collects the voter's name, address, date of birth, and a partial social security number, but really interestingly, it also collects a browser fingerprint, which is a kind of tracking mechanism that's sort of like a super cookie. Uh, it's something that you actually can't delete uh, off your system at all, even if you're in like private browsing mode. Uh, it also uploads the voter's secret ballot selections, even if the voter prints and physically mails in the ballot. So in the case where you mark the ballot uh, locally, it actually ends up serv uh, serving your voters, uh, voter selections, your ballot selections, uh, to Democracy Live servers. Finally, the system uses Google Analytics, and Google gets your voter, voter ID and therefore your party affiliation. Uh, and again, there's no privacy policy and no public restriction on any of the uh, use of any of this data. Uh, and to reiterate, right, this information is highly valuable for political purposes or for election interference, uh, as it can be used to target ads or disinformation campaigns based on the uh, voter's fine-grained preferences, and there's no restriction on use of data here, which is very worrying. All right, so we found all of this, all of these, these uh, interesting properties of the system. Uh, what do we think about what this means in the larger picture? And really what I want to tell you about is the fact that there have been five uh, security analyses of internet voting systems used in real-world high-stakes elections, and there appears to be an ongoing pattern that I want to point out. Uh, the first is that they were all deployed be uh, before public analysis was done. Uh, all of them had significant barriers to analysis and disclosure, including the need to reverse engineer or uh, code obfuscation or N NDAs and other limitations. All of them had poor misleading documentation of, of how the system worked, except for the source post system, uh, which was actually instrumental in finding the vulnerabilities that they found. Uh, and finally, there were a number of, all of them suffered from implementation and or design flaws. And my point is that there's clearly a need for regulation requiring public security analysis prior to these systems being fielded in, in real elections. And in lieu of this regulation, science has been stepping up to provide insight to help regulators understand these risks and really must continue to do so until a ban or other regulation is implemented. So to summarize, uh, we presented here uh, the first security analysis of an internet uh, voting system in US federal elections. Uh, and in fact, the first analysis of a, of a remote accessible vote by mail system. We found a number of security and privacy issues uh, that were then reported uh, both to the vendor and to uh, CISA and DHS and the uh, affected parties. Um, what I'm really proud of, though, is that New Jersey and Delaware actually halted use of OmniBallot for this internet voting for the electronic return. Uh, however, uh, the, the system is still used in West Virginia and Denver in November 2020. So with that, thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to hearing your questions.